Yep, you got to be the video. Mm. Hi and welcome to the channel. This time around I've got three science fiction movies for you. They're kind of, one of them's good, one of them's medium, one of them's not quite as good. But they cover pretty much what we had for 1960s science fiction. There was old school hard science fiction in the 1960s. There was new wave science fiction which was typified by the output of New Worlds magazine from England in the 1960s and we had science fiction horror and the third movie has that in it though i may mix up the order there who knows so we'll start off with the fun one it was directed and the script was written by robert foost who adapted it from a 1968 novel by michael moorcock the original novel the final program was very much new wave science fiction it had a non-linear structure at times it jumped around to different events it wasn't strictly following the rules of science it was satirical it had a lot more in common with uh, underground comic books than it did with hard science fiction in so many ways but it was immensely popular and in 1973 a movie was made of it the final program it stars john finch as michael moorcock's all-purpose protagonist Jerry Cornelius, uh, Jenny Runnaker playing Miss Brunner, the really weird succubus, who is part of a project to accumulate the sum total of human knowledge into one more or less human being. God, that place must be a shambles. You heard about Amsterdam? Yeah, some mistake. <laughs> 28 square miles of white ash. For once, the Americans did a good job. Now, Robert Foust, you know from having made the two Dr. Fibes movies a few years before, the ones with Vincent Price in them, which were very stylish and very stylized. And the style is what it's all about. And this movie is full of that Robert Foust style. It's not a faithful adaptation of the original work, but then to do a faithful adaptation of the original work, you probably would have had to have $30 million at the time and a cast of thousands. So that really wasn't possible on the kind of budget that EMI had at the time to make this film. Originally, it was going to star two different actors, which would have been really, really interesting. Timothy Dalton and Vanessa Redgrave were originally asked to do it. Mick Jagger was asked to do it and said no because he thought it was weird. And any movie script that Mick Jagger thinks is weird has got to be worth doing. They settled for John Finch, who had just been in Roman Polanski's version of Macbeth and had very good reviews from that. And Jenny Runnaker, who is an incredible presence in this movie. Her character, Miss Brunner, who was named after another science fiction writer in England, John Brunner, is a really intense really interesting and an oddly sexy character who has the ability to absorb the bodies and the skills and talents of other human beings in the movie jerry is the son of a late scientist alexander cornelius who had been working on compiling the sum total of human knowledge his brother frank is a sleazy cockney junkie um even though <laughs> Jerry himself in the movie speaks with received pronunciation. And his sister Catherine has been captured in the their father's mansion by Frank and kept drugged. Now the lights are coming from the house. It's just across the water. They're designed to cause pseudo-epilepsy. The supporting cast is really great as well. You've got Harry Andrews playing John, the housekeeper of the mansion. You get um, people like Hugh Griffith turning up, Patrick McGee. Ronald Lacey, who played the Nazi with the coat hanger in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Julie Edge. Do you know Rome at all? We've met. I love it. Doesn't seem the same without the Vatican. Though. I like the new place better. Sterling Hayden playing an American general called Wrongway Lindbergh, who is cutting various military tech deals from an apartment in London. And a, a very ramshackle London it is. And uh, he gets some of the best lines in the movie in his one scene. And we get the sense of a kind of prolonged, very slow World War Three happening in this world. Things are going bad and people are holding things together. The old paradigms don't hold up. And a group of scientists have decided that 
Given that the apocalypse is about to happen and the apocalypse is more to do with a cyclic thing based on Indian mythology more than anything else, given that the apocalypse is about to happen, these scientists, two of whom are played by Graham Crowden and George Kalouris, have decided that they're going to help Miss Brunner using Alexander Cornelius's formula, create the perfect self-replicating human being who's a hermaphrodite and can self-impregnate and populate the post-apocalyptic world with versions of itself. Like I said, doesn't make a lot of sense logically. But it is a lot of fun. The script is very, very funny. There's some very funny one-liners in it. And they're almost thrown away too. The jokes sometimes don't land because they've moved on to the next eye-popping visual or the next joke to move the story such as it is along. Oh, Mr. Cornelius, your motives in helping us seem a trifle obscure. How about revenge? That do? Revenge? Ah, yes, grudges, that sort of thing. A very sound motive. Now, this movie didn't get a lot of love at the time. I went and saw it when it first came out in the cinemas, and it wasn't shown very much in cinemas in Australia. In fact, I had to take a train from Liverpool into Sydney City and then out to Rose Bay Winter Garden Cinema to see this movie because it wasn't showing anywhere else, and I had a Saturday off, and it took me about two hours to get there by train, but I went and saw it, and I'd read the book, but I kind of was a little bit sad that it wasn't a faithful adaptation of the book because I didn't quite understand what it would have taken to do a fan to do a faithful adaptation of the book at the time but I kind of like the movie um, it's not the best science fiction or even science fiction pastiche movie and that last scene really shows that they didn't know how to stick the landing I think the result that we get from the final program kind of makes you go meh which is a, a little bit of a shame the novel does it much more interestingly and possibly in a way that would have taken a lot more makeup effects than were available in the movie itself this version by network video doesn't have a lot of extras it's got a full frame version of the movie it's got the original theatrical tra trailers it's got an italian title sequence which is a little clearer than the english language one an image gallery and promotional material on PDFs, which kind of dates it a little bit. But just to finalize this one, it's good to see something of Moorcock's being done. I know he did a script for one of the Doug McClure, Edgar Rice Burroughs adaptations in the 1970s, but there's not a lot of Moorcock that really gets any kind of visual representation and visual versions. I think there may be an Elric of Melibene adaptation in the wind, but he's the kind of writer whose work doesn't lend itself to easy adaptation into a, a cinematic version. I've got an odd fondness for this one. I think that it's a, a little bit of fun. It's not to be taken any more seriously than something like the Dr. Fibes movies. And if you go, yes, it's a Moorcock adaptation, it's not a faithful one, but it's one of those playful kind of movies like the Dr. Fibers movies. You're going to enjoy it a lot more than if you take it way too seriously. So that's the first one. And we move on to the second one, which I kind of grabbed off the shelf because I wanted to make three movies for this video. And the third movie I was going to do, I haven't received the Blu-ray off yet. I should be getting it in the next few days, but that's how things work sometimes. And I will do that for a future video. So I went for this one, and it's a weird little film, which is a good thing. It's from a box set called Roger Corman's... Um, Roger Corman's Cold Classics All Night Marathon. And when you've got a, a box set called that, you're going to give the movies a go, at least. There are four movies in it. The Velvet Vampire, Time Walker, Grotesque, and the one I'm going to talk about, Lady Frankenstein. It's from 1971, so you know it's good. And it's an Italian-German co-production, which stars Joseph Cotton as Dr. Frankenstein, Rosalba Neri as his daughter Tanya. His assistant is played by an actor called Paul Mueller. And the grave robber that Frankenstein gets to deliver the bodies to him so he can patch together his creations is played by an actor called Herbert Fuchs which is spelled F-U-X. And I remember seeing Herbert Fuchs' name 
on credits when I was a kid watching movies that were uh, kind of English adaptations of German films and laughing like a drain because of his name. Now this was at the last stages of Joseph Cotton's career. He had some health issues and he was running around Europe making movies. He'd made Latitude Zero in the 1960s with his wife Patricia Medina and he made a whole bunch of very much lesser movies um, for fairly low budgets during the 1960s and 1970s which is a shame because I like Joseph Cotton as an actor and even in something like Lady Frankenstein he actually does commit to delivering a performance in the role he doesn't just walk his way through it the way a number of other actors of his vintage did when their careers were diminishing in the 1970s he's paying off grave robbers in this one and his Frankenstein is putting bodies together and his beautiful daughter Tanya, played by Rosalba Neri, comes home and finds out that he's actually experimenting on human beings rather than animals as she previously thought. Now she's just become a doctor and there's a little bit of a kind of feminist slant to this movie where she found it very difficult to get her degree because women getting medical degrees was frowned on in the 19th century. So the director Mel Wells who played Mushnik in the original Little Shop of Horrors, by the way, wanted to give it a little more of a feminist spin, and all credit to him for that. Now, Frankenstein, of course, is always a dodgy and, and kind of nasty character who's sick, a really sick puppy. But his daughter is worse in this one. Father, will you both stop treating me like a child? I'm a doctor. A surgeon. I even think like you do. I. His daughter Tanya sees a intellectually disabled but very beautiful man when she comes back to the village and kind of thinks he's hot. But she falls in love with Frankenstein's assistant Charles, even though she says he's too much too old. When Frankenstein himself is killed by one of his creations, and there's a slight spoiler here, so bear with me. She takes over the family business and works with Charles to create. A monster now that the monster that gets created by Frankenstein the original Frankenstein kills him and goes on a rampage in the countryside mostly attacking courting couples in the countryside and there is some quite gratuitous nudity in this film and um, for no good reason apart from the fact that it gives you a little bit more runtime in the movie so Tanya comes up with a genius plan to get everything she wants she decides and, and talks Charles into it to transplant the brain of Charles into the body of the intellectually disabled hunk living in the village so that she can have exactly what she wants. She's got the man she loves in a younger body. Now that's about five or six different layers of sickness there but that's what she wants. So she decides to seduce the young man and uh, Rosalba Neri is quite a beautiful woman and we do get to see quite a bit of her in the film and while they are in flagrante delecto Charles suffocates him with a pillow he then gets his brain transplanted into the body and the villagers and the local police the police captain there is Captain Harris played by Mickey Hargate who was the husband of Jane Mansfield and the father of Mariska Hargate he was known mostly for muscle man roles but this was later in his career so he kept his clothes on um, he's kind of investigating these mysterious murders and body snatchings that are going on in the village not too successfully until right at the end we get the usual ending with the locals with the pitchforks and torches which is always welcome i really like seeing that in a frankenstein movie and things go a bit belly up and then there's a very abrupt ending i like this one for a couple of reasons one of which is it's kind of incredibly typical of a certain kind of B or C grade horror movie that was put out as a program filler in the 1970s. It's got some location shooting, it's got some interesting lab laboratory sets and it's got a couple of well-known older actors, in this case Joseph Cotton and probably Mickey Hargate. And it's, it's kind of not meant to be good. It's meant to be successful enough to make them some money. And 
this is that kind of 1970s film where Hammer in the 1950s and 60s had become successful and everybody who could get the money together tried to make a horror movie so that they could get a bit of that sweet box office. Now this movie was made for a couple of weird reasons. Part of the money was put up by Roger Corman so that he could get the American distribution rights. Part of the money was put up by one of the Vanderbilt heirs, a guy whose last name, oddly enough, was Cushing, who was pretty much a good-looking playboy around Europe at the time and decided he wanted to court the actress Rosal Bonneri. She didn't want to have a bar of him. He was a facile little know-nothing playboy and she had no interest in him at all. So basically a rich guy made this movie to try to seduce the leading actress and she said no, which shows that the um, bottom end and top end for that matter of the film industry in the 1970s was mostly about sex and unfortunately about coercion. Six and a half hours later. I kind of enjoyed it more than I expected to. There's a lot of this kind of movie around and a lot of them are available on these fairly cheap um, discs. But Lady Frankenstein kind of worked for me because it, it doesn't try to do anything particularly new, but it does what it does pretty well. So I'm just going to leave that there. I may look at the other movies that are on this one, The Velvet Vampire, Time Walker and Grotesque for future videos. I know Time Walker gets a little bit of love. I know The Velvet Vampire's got a little bit of gratuitous nudity as well, but I don't know much about the movie Grotesque, so I'm going to have to check that one out a little more closely. That brings us to the third movie, which is directed by John Sturgis. It's from 1969. An imprint have just put out a really nice Blu-ray package of it. Marooned. Starring Gregory Peck, James Franciscus, Richard Crenna, Gene Hackman and David Jansen. There's the inside cover of it with some of the other cover art. There's extras on this one as well. There's um, an audio commentary by Brian Reisman, Kim Newman talking about Marooned, and uh, a feature about the final films of John Sturgis called The Troubled Master. Now, John Sturgis, this was his fourth or fifth last film. John Sturgis was the master of widescreen cinema in the 50s and 60s. His movies like Gunfight at the OK Corral, Bad Day at Black Rock, The Great Escape, The Magnificent Seven, all use that widescreen perfectly. And then they're giving this near future space disaster movie where a lot of it is shot in offices in a quite a fairly small mission control set and in cramped spaceships. Now, there are a few scenes using that wonderful eye that John Sturgis had for widescreen landscapes. But for the most part, it is a movie set in those kind of tight confines. And maybe Sturgis saw it as a challenge for himself, but it's not really the kind of thing he does as well as he does other things, let's say. Now, the movie was based on a 1964 novel by Martin Caden, the same guy who created the original novel Cyborg that became the Six Million Dollar Man. Had a bit of a long lead time too because Frank Capra, yeah, it's a wonderful life, Frank Capra, wanted to make a movie of it in 1965 and tried to raise funds to get that movie made. Capra wasn't able to get the money together for the movie. So the movie sat on the shelf until Columbia Pictures made it in 1969. And that's where the problem lies. Now, the story's pretty simple. Uh, three astronauts played by Richard Crenner, James Franciscus, and Gene Hackman spend six months up on an experimental space station, which is a little bit like Skylab was a couple of years later. And NASA decides to bring them down after six months because the Gene Hackman character is not sleeping and he is showing signs of stress. And so they don't want to prolong the mission to the point where that guy cracks up. So they get them back into the um, module and start heading towards Earth. And when the re-entry burn is supposed to happen, it doesn't happen. So the guys are trapped up there. Their oxygen is running out. They've got about 42 hours before they're sucking carbon dioxide. And so some plans are made to try to rescue them. The first plan doesn't work. The Russians try to assist with one of their Vostok um, space capsules, but that kind of comes in very late in the piece. 
and the chief astronaut, a guy called Doherty, played by David Jensen, comes up with a really crazy left field idea of mounting an experimental lifting body onto a rocket, launching it up there and refitting the lifting body to carry four men and bring them back. The problem is that there's a hurricane heading towards Florida and it's going to hit the Cape at the time they need to launch. So there are all these complications and all of these problems that have to be solved. It's very much a hard science fiction movie set three days from now at the time. So 1969 in the near future. The astronauts up in the space capsule talk about things. Richard Crenna says he's going to be too old to go for the Mars shot. But Stoney, the character played by James Franciscus, who's a kind of analytical scientist, is, is trying to work things through. And he'll probably get a chance at the Mars shot. So it's set in an alternate universe where NASA and America decides to keep going with the space program, which is kind of cool. Now, at the time, Gene Hackman was the least known of the actors. He was still two years away from Popeye Doyle and the French Connection. And his character, he, he gets short shrift, really, because his character is the one that's cracking up and he's got to kind of play that bewildered and mentally stressed character, which he does really well. Franciscus is, is as good as I've seen him in anything playing Stoney and Richard Krenner is, is always reliable as the other astronaut. David Jansen does a fantastic job as Doherty as well. His character really is the guy you want on your side when there's this kind of crisis there. His hands are in his pocket, he's thoughtful, he's working things through. Meanwhile the head of NASA is played by Gregory Peck who gives you a standard Gregory Peck. I've got two issues with this movie. First one is that there are times when the process shots just don't work. The lighting between the space capsule in the foreground and the astronaut or the space capsule and the astronaut and the background of the stars is really badly done. They did that stupid, stupid, stupid thing that Hollywood did with a lot of space movies in that they made the sky behind the stars dark blue instead of pitch black. Now, that's a mistake that Kubrick didn't make in 2001. But when you see it in a movie, particularly on a widescreen movie in high definition, having that slight blue tinge to the space between the stars really takes you out of the movie in a way. So uh, the, a lot of the pressure shots are pretty good. They're about state of the art for the time. Not quite as good as Kubrick and 2001 and the, the guys who worked on that one. But still pretty good for a studio film in America in the late 1960s. The other problem I've got is the astronauts' wives because they are given such short shrift in this movie. And we get this line of dialogue during the bit where Doherty is telling the wives that there's a chance their husbands aren't going to come back from this mission. And they give Marriott Hartley this line to say. Teresa, Celia and I have been in this business 10 years. We learned that the best thing is for us girls to keep our feelings to ourselves and let the men get on with their jobs. For any modern viewer, it's going to be a WTF moment. Now, having said that, the drama works really well. There's a really great bit where they've got a launch window for the lifting body, which is very unusual. I remember when I saw this movie in the cinemas back in the day, the coolest thing about the movie was the way they launched the lifting body. And I liked that a lot at the time. Um, I was into space stuff because you remember this is 1969, which is the cool thing about this movie and it's the bad thing about this movie because it came out a couple of months after Apollo 11 and after Apollo 12. So people were kind of over seeing guys going around the earth. They had just seen four men walk on the moon in real, for real. And so they were past just orbiting around the earth and, and that kind of thing. So the movie when it came out was already dated. And then of course, Apollo 13 happened, which had a, um, disaster or a near disaster not entirely dissimilar to the plot of Marooned and Jim Lovell and his wife had seen a Marooned and Jim Lovell's wife said that she was very scared because she had seen Marooned and then her husband is suddenly um, circling around the moon and on his way back and they've got a kind of kludge together a solution to keep those astronauts alive they got back you can have a look at ron howard's movie apollo 13 for the details of that 
So the movie was at that weird, not sweet spot, that sour spot between the first two Apollo missions and Apollo 13. And so it didn't do particularly well because people were over that kind of thing and reality had exceeded what that movie was providing. And that kind of is an interesting place for a film to be historically. Having said that, it kind of works well. I think that most of the acting is pretty on point. I think that the plot moves along nicely. And there are some great shots that John Sturgis does outdoors, particularly around Cape Kennedy slash Cape Canaveral, which look really good and should kind of remind us of the best of John Sturgis. You get a little bit of that with the Satan bug as well. Anytime you put John Sturgis in a big wide landscape with a camera, you're going to get something that's worth watching. And his selection of shots and camera angles on those outdoor scenes during Marooned are one of the saving graces of it. It really does look fantastic on a big screen. But ultimately, I've got to say the movie kind of fails because a movie that, that's kind of one note, it's, it takes itself very, very seriously. There aren't any jokes, there isn't any kind of moments of lightness or moments of difference to offer more than the seriousness and the kind of hard science-y pseudo-factuality of the movie. It makes it a little bit cold and dispassionate, but it's not a bad film, it's worth re-watching, it's worth seeing, definitely. So that's it for this time around. Uh, on Saturday I will be doing the last third of the movies selected by the viewers and there's some pretty good movies there i've got to watch them again and i may well do it as a live stream as well and i'll go through where all the 31 movies that i offered for selection landed in the votes of the viewers so that's going to be a pretty long one so i may do it as a two-hour live stream the first hour is going to be the movie reviews and the tallying of the votes and the second hour is just going to be me shooting the shit with the people who are on the live stream. But even if you're not able to make the live stream on Saturday, it'll be definitely worth watching because there's going to be some good movies there, some good movie reviews. I'm going to have a lot of fun with that one. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking, subscribing, leaving a comment. You can also support the channel at patreon.com slash paleocinema. Uh, the weather's turning autumnal around here, which is a bit of a shame. So I'm going to get my flu shot and take care of myself a little bit. Do the same for yourself. Watch some good science fiction movies. Watch some bad science fiction movies. Watch some weird science fiction movies. And I'll catch you next time. I know that feeling.